So let me first open by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I openly witness that there is nothing to be worshipped except Allah. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammad. And I openly witness that Muhammad, Abduhu wa Rasuluhu, is his slave servant and his messenger. Dear beloved Muslim brothers, I give you the greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be able to hear anything. It should be so quiet in here that you feel like the place is empty, except for the feeling of life and the spirit of brotherhood. You should feel like the place is so quiet that it's empty of noise, and that's what it should be. We should be able to hear a pin fall if it fell on pavement or hard surface or fly flying around in the auditorium. Thank you. Now let me begin by thanking you for being present here tonight. Now, what you're going to hear tonight, as what you hear whenever you hear teach the true teachings of Islam, is so valuable to you that you are obligated to thank, say thank you if you are indeed a believer. But I am thanking you. And I thank you because your support is my strength. And if you don't support me, then I don't have that strength. When I see you come out lively and strong as you have reported here tonight, it makes me feel very, very proud and very, very, makes me feel very, very special. Because there are not many leaders today who have genuine support. All praise is due to Allah. And I know that with this kind of support, we are not going to fail. We are going to accomplish the job. It's a big job, but every day I see the sign that we are going to make it. We have made it this far, and we have big successes behind us in this two years that we have been battling to come out of the first resurrection and establish ourselves in the second. We have accomplished great things, great things. We have done things that I don't believe any organization, religion, or movement was able, has ever been able to do. I don't know of it in history. Now, if you know of it, you have to tell me. I don't know anywhere in history where there have been as, as drastic a change as we have made with a smooth a change as we have had. Our change has been a smooth change, easy and smooth change. And our success has been a great one. Our attendance now is better than it used to be. We didn't lose attendance. We gained in attendance. We didn't lose progress. Our progress increased. If we consider all the 
goal, uh, part gains that we have realized since making the drastic changes that we have made, that we began making, pardon me, two years ago, approximately, February 26th, we will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is God's doing, that this is the doing of the Lord of the heavens and earth, that I have not brought this about by myself, but I have only been used to bring it about, and it is God himself, Allah, the Almighty, the Eternal, the one who lives, and is not fed, who acts, but needs no rest, neither slumber nor sleep, who is not physical and yet is in constant touch with every physical thing, though it be smaller than an atom. That God has brought me this far, and that God is with me and is with you who follow. So fear not, you are the righteous, the best, and the most powerful. That was said a few years ago, now it is a fact. What I mean by a few years ago, about 40 some years ago. <laughs> Master Fadid Muhammad said, you are the righteous, the best, and the powerful. He said, I can sit on top of the world and tell anyone that the most beautiful people or nation is in the wilderness of North America. <laughs> what did he mean? In that saying, how are we the most beautiful people he had seen all over the world when he had seen Muslims who had never touched pork, who had never known whiskey, cigarettes, fornication, adultery, stealing, thieving, robbery, rape, etc., gambling. He had seen people who had never known these things. There's no occurrence of these things in their society. Now, what did he mean that we were the most beautiful? He meant that over here, he saw a people that had a thirst for God's blessings. And that if God would bless them, they would be the best people on the face of the earth. Because no other people on the, on the face of the earth showed as much thirst for God's pure water as we did. He had been among the people, the Muslim people of the world, and he had seen how anxious they were to hear something about God, about the the prophets, and especially about the last prophet and the, the message of the Quran that was revealed to him, but he had never seen people as anxious to learn about God and truth as you were. Conditions had made you like that. You had been separated from ancestors, separated from uh, traditional knowledge of God, and you had been given all of your knowledge of God from the people who captured you are the people in whose hands you fell. Is that right? So you wanted to know, is there something else beyond this? I know these people are not our ancestors. 
the American people are the people that we came under or fell into uh, under as slaves. So is there something? What's beyond that? That big question was in the mind of all of the descendants of our ancestors, the slaves. That big question. What was before that? What was before Jamestown, Virginia? You know, the big question was in all of our minds. And we uh, didn't have a natural connection with the history of religion, or the truth of religion. Our connection was one uh, of adoption. We were allowed to take on the religion. And the religion didn't come from our true parents, it came from one that adopted us. Is that right? So you always have a suspicion. Is this really what was yesterday? So you want to get back in touch with the past. So when the foreigner came here who wasn't uh, 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 American or European, he was an Arab, or at least looking like an Arab, we wanted to know, well, stranger, can you tell me something about my past that these people didn't tell me? Well, stranger, can you tell me something about God that these people didn't tell me? So he saw in us more willingness and more I desire and anxiousness, and eagerness to get knowledge of God, knowledge of truth. We wanted to know the facts. We wanted the truth. We didn't trust the Caucasians who had enslaved us and who had denied us equality and justice. We didn't want it. We couldn't trust them. So we want to know. Maybe they told us the truth, maybe not. Stranger, can you tell me something? Is God the God they say or not, you know? So Master Ferran saw in us this, this great thirst for knowledge of the truth. And he saw that once we, we got a little knowledge of God that we could accept as truth, we became more faithful to God, even though we wrongly conceived him, wrongly imagined him, wrongly pictured him in our mind. We became more faithful to that God that we believe now is the God than those who had been serving God without any interruption over there in the lands we call Islamic lands. So because of that, he said, I can sit on top of the world and tell anybody that the most beautiful people are in the wilderness of North America. Our the most beautiful nation is in the wilderness of North America. Now you know the honor of Elijah Muhammad, even in the allegorical language, he did tell us that Master Farad, I don't know how many of you heard it, but I'm sure that if you followed for years, you heard him at least say it once openly. But he used to say it to us in uh, private home sitting often. He said Master Farad wasn't talking so much in the present all the time, so he was talking in the future. So when he said you were the most beautiful nation on the face of the earth, he was seeing into the future. Seeing that if these people stay like this, one day, when they really, when their really eyes really come up open to the whole truth, they are going to be the be most beautiful people on the face of the earth. And they are going to be the righteous. They are going to be the most powerful. So he said, I can sit on the top of the world and tell you, anybody, that you are the most beautiful. And he said, you are the righteous. Not that you were the righteous then. You were the righteous only then uh, in spirit. You had a willing, willingness, a willingness, pardon me. You had a willingness for righteousness, but you hadn't yet been shown righteousness. So you had been shown righteousness in part, but your willingness was complete. I'm not talking about every one of you, but I'm talking about the majority who accepted the leadership of Master Fadid Muhammad and stuck with it, and the majority who followed that leadership and it was passed down to the Honorable Master Elijah Muhammad and followed it. The majority of those people had a complete willingness to follow the righteousness of God. If they failed, it was because they just didn't know. So you see how slavery, how kidnapping, 
how cutting us off from our roots, from our traditional knowledge, family knowledge, can't you see how that really worked? To put us in position to rise over all people in terms of moral strength, devotion to truth, worship of God. Don't you see how that works? To rise us to the top? Listen, brothers. Almighty God, if he brings a suffering or permits a terrible thing to happen in the lives of the people for which there is no clear justification, then God has allowed that to happen because he has a bigger thing he wants to give to that people. And he's just preparing them to be big enough to receive the bigness of that thing he has to give them. So by emptying us so thoroughly, taking this knowledge out of us, letting the society kill our knowledge, empty our minds of everything that is self or original, forcing us to have to take on things that are another man, that are not ourselves. We had to take on his language, on his identity, on his mentality, everything except his attitude. We couldn't take on his attitude because attitudes uh, are something that's prompted by uh, conscious behavior. And you can't have your own attitude if what you have taken on is not your own. So you couldn't consciously take on his attitude and he couldn't give you his attitude. Why? Because attitudes are something that arise out of something that's there. And all that was there was him. So in yourself, you were a dead man. Can you understand that? It's like taking on the framework of a man, but not the life of that man. We take, took on the mental framework. We took on the mental framework, the mind of the man but we didn't take on the intelligence of the man. We took on the knowledge of the man, but not the intelligence of the man. So intelligence, conscious intelligence are needed to affect attitude. Attitude changes. So our attitudes were in the hands of the man. All of our attitudes were formed by the society. Is that right? And we couldn't change our attitude unless the society changed our attitude. Until a new mind came. When a new mind came, then we were able to change our attitude and take on a new attitude. And those attitudes were not our own. They were attitudes that rose up from a dead man. I'm going to explain what I'm telling you. I want you to understand. You had taken on a mind that was not yours. You mean to tell me the mind Master Rod gave us was not ours? Yes, I mean exactly that. It was not yours. It was his. He made it. And then gave it to you. And you couldn't, you couldn't, uh, Establish it, you could only believe in it and defend it. But you couldn't uh, connect it with its past. You couldn't show how it descended to you. All you know is that you got it. Right? And whenever you had to defend it, you couldn't, you couldn't think with your own mind. You had to just echo what you were taught. Is that right? Yeah. So you were still a dead man. But a dead man who at least believed his mind was his own. Before you knew your mind wasn't your own. You knew your mind was the mind that was given to you by the people who enslaved you. But when Master Rod gave you a mind, you were told that that was the mind of your ancestors. So you believed it was your own. Well, what about you now, 
Hey, cheesy ma'am, aren't you giving us a mind of your, your mind? No, indeed. I'm giving you the mind. And in giving you the mind, you get your mind. The mind that I give you is as much yours as it is anybody else. And when you accept that mind, you begin to grow as an individual. You are able to handle this by yourself. Am I right or wrong? You don't need to keep referring back to any catechism. <laughs> the original man is the Asiatic black man and 60,000 did this so many a million years ago or so many thousand years ago. You don't need any facts and figures of that nature and you don't need any uh, recorded message that you have to repeat over and over again. You can speak now from your own mind. See, that's the difference. Once you are given truth, the light comes on. And you find that you have control of yourself and that you are able to speak and defend your position by yourself. You don't even have to say TV man. And if you have listened and learned the lesson that I've been given out by the guidance and power of Almighty God, you can defend yourself by yourself and you never have to mention my name. You never have to mention Master Farrar's name. You never have to mention my father's name. You never have to, have to mention the lessons that I'm giving you. You don't even have to use my words. You can use your own words. You don't have to use a word of the whole Quran. You don't have to use a word in the Bible. And you can defend yourself and your position. And then I can come behind it and say, did you hear what he said? Did you hear what he just told you? The people say, yes. Yeah. I say the same thing. Hold up. The Quran says the same thing. The Bible says the same thing. Every true teacher or every man that had truth, whether it was allegorical, symbolical, no matter what form it was in, he said the same thing. The sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the water, the land, the air, and everything manifests out of it and everything between these two says the same thing. to do to Allah. So now, we are out of the grave. The Bible says that hell must give up the dead. That there is one coming who will have power over hell and death. You are looking at that one right now, whether you believe it or not. Almighty God has been growing me for a long, long time. <laughs> Yesterday I was many righteous men and many well-meaning men, but they were all members of my body. Now all the members are together in me. <laughs> 
this man is finally made. Well, who you saying you are? Imam W.D. Muhammad? I am the Christ. About 2,000 years ago, that man that lived was a sign of what you see right today. <laughs> Nothing but the plain, simple truth. There's no great mysteries once we tell you. It's simple to understand. Prophet Muhammad, he is the last and universal prophet. He is the image of the movement of human society, fulfilled and completed in him. And what you see here today, in this day and time among you, is the fulfillment of the movement of the individual makeup. Prophet Muhammad represents society, and I represent the individual. The individual has to develop to complete man, being in touch with the world of reality, and growing naturally as a person without having him, his, himself separated from reality by some false wall. You see? Say, well, doesn't uh, didn't Prophet Muhammad do that? Yes. Yeah. But it's not manifest until today. What he was doing was bringing together reality and human existence. The reality of creation and the reality of human existence, or human makeup. That's what his job was. So that we can see what is the proper order of human society. And in him, proper social order was established for society. Not just for yesterday, for all time. But did we ever see in his day the fulfillment of the individual coming to full bloom? No. Say, well, Prophet Muhammad did. Certainly, he did. But it did not become a reality for the people. If everything had come a, real, become a reality for the people, and if there was no reason or no need for the individual human being to reach completion and be established before the eyes of the world, in reality, then Prophet Muhammad wouldn't have said that Jesus and myself will be together in the end of time. And he wouldn't have said that the believers in Christ will not die before seeing him return. He wouldn't have said these things. So he said that it was a divine requirement that Jesus return. So that's why you find many Muslims believing in the return of Christ, return of Jesus, because there's authentic hadith saying that he has to return. You find some authorities that differ, say, well, we don't accept that, it's not right. But if you would question them, those who have knowledge, 
They will say, we say it is not right because we know it is not right the way they are saying it. You see? They're expecting a physical man to come back and that's not going to happen. But the knowledge that human beings as individuals should have in order to really survive without fear and without grouping in the dark is not only the knowledge of revelation but the knowledge of the secrets of revelation concerning the real life of the individual the makeup of the real man you haven't hinted in the holy quran Nefsalawama, means the man who is under the powers of his flesh. Hunger, pain, sex appetite in his flesh, fear of being killed physically. All of these things that are connected directly with the flesh. The man that is under that, he's nef. El la amara. Then there's nef, the Holy Quran says there's nefsal lawama. Nefsal lawama means the man who has come alive rationally and he's now looking at himself and truth and he's going back and forth between reality and himself to make proper adjustments on himself. I'm out of order. I'm not right. And his conscience bothers him when he's going on out of order and don't have the moral strength to put himself in order. So he's nest and low hammer. So man comes up out of his flesh, gets out under the power of the flesh, into rational knowledge, and begins to trust knowledge, sound knowledge. And he begins to rule his flesh. He knows better than to give himself to those things. And uh, at that time, he begins to waver backwards and forwards between reality and himself, right? Then he comes out of that, if he's successful, Allah blesses him to come out of that into nefs al Nefs al means that self that has found his rest. He doesn't do that anymore. He has stopped. You see? He has stopped because his own, he has taken on the nature of truth. There's no movement between two objects. He has become one with truth. Why does he have to go to truth and swing back to self? Self has become truth. So there's no movement. There's just growth within himself. You see? He has identified with truth, you see? Now the Holy Quran tells us about these three stages of development. And uh, scripture before the Holy Quran told us about these. Body, mind, and spirit. You see? But the Holy Quran goes uh, further and uh, uh, expounds our, our, our discourse. Carries on a discourse that expands and clarifies even more. But the Holy Quran tells us that still these three are a mystery. Do you have any proof for this? Yes. It says Allah will come with his angels in the clouds. Not just the Bible, the Holy Quran says. And again the Holy Quran says, in the judgment, Allah, uh, the judgment will send up three columns of smoke. What are these three columns of smoke? The smoke of sin, yes. We don't need smoke to just tell sin, to say sin. Smoke is cloudy. Smoke hides out, hides the light. Smoke is associated with fire. Fire is identified with rational knowledge. Light is associated with fire. Fire is identified as wisdom. The light of the flame is wisdom. Light is fewer than the flame. Is that right? The flame itself is rational processes, rational knowledge working. The truth that is born by the process is right. The light of the flame is pure. The light of the flame is comfortable. 
Light doesn't burn them. All right, let's, uh, I don't want to go too far with this. It would take too long. Okay, so the Quran says that three columns of smoke will be seen going out. These three columns of smoke, the wise in the religion, will tell you that it means the three cells, not self in completion, but the three stages of self development. Your self develop along three main stages. That is, first, the sense body that is in the flesh. Secondly, the rational body that is in the intelligence. And lastly, the morally rational body that's called spiritual body. Why is it called spiritual? Because in order to be born, it can't uh, trust flesh or concrete things. In order to be born, it must trust the unknown. Something that it can't verify physically or rationally. Oh, how can you trust something like that? Because you feel in yourself that there is something stronger than what the world has given you. You feel in yourself that there's a stronger reality, a power, more powerful reality than what your physical eyes can reveal or what your limited intelligence can find. So you trust what you feel. And that trust is called spirit. Spirit. So the only way to come to that truth is by spiritual giving spiritual submission. And that's why it's called a spiritual development. Nestel mutma'enna doesn't mean spiritual development literally, but we identify it all down through the history. People have identified that form as a spiritual form. And it's not that it's spooky or invisible. It means that it is brought to birth or made uh, uh, birth by spiritual forces and not by physical forces, and not by your own rational, limited rational abilities. You understand? All right. So the whole of Quran is saying this, and they identify the clouds of smoke that, uh, uh, that's rising up with that. Now, if there's matter, and we set it afire, the smoke that comes out of it is one. The flame that arises is another. The light that shines forth is another. Is that right? If it was fuel light, it wouldn't make any smoke. <laughs> is that right? So uh, we, the, 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 the message that is given here in the Holy Quran is that confusion will last. Confusion, darkness, ignorance of the nature of the individual the makeup of the individual. It will stay until the last day. And in the last day, the gross matter will be burned out of the confusion. And we'll see the flame, we'll see the light, and we'll see the smoke. The smoke is the ignorance that was in the body. The flame is the nature of the, of the rational mind. And the light is the truth that is born out of that. You see? That time is now. It didn't happen back then. <laughs> Prophet Muhammad pointed to the sign. Jesus was the sign. Jesus was a sign. A sign of what? A sign of the rational makeup of the man. A sign that that rational makeup of the man is going to become a full body in time. He has to return. That has to return. But now, that sign that 
uh, was Jesus is not the only sign. So Prophet Muhammad being a universal prophet, setting and establishing the order of, 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 of society and completing the building of society so we can see what a complete society should look like. That man fulfilling the prophetic movement and completing the movement of prophets or the succession of prophets. He pointed to signs, not just Jesus. He pointed to signs everywhere. It says in the sky there are signs. In the earth below there are signs. And in you there are signs. And Jesus and his mother were signs. You see? Now who understood that? That knowledge had to come. And you would be just a waste of creation, a waste of matter, if you got your own thinking, uh, faculty, uh, reasoning faculties, and refuse to accept and appreciate and follow me as the fulfillment of that. Nobody else in the history of man have come before the people and took scripture and say, you want to know what this means? There it is. Bring it down and show it to you plainly enough. You don't have to go to a theological school. You can be right from the coal yard. Right from the farm. Right from the packing house or from the factory, or right from the streets as a pimp. And if you would just sit down and listen, you say, gee, man, I can understand that. I don't have no problem with that. Don't you know men have been wrestling with scripture, wrestling with the signs, wrestling with terminology, and just couldn't make it. In fact, they gave up. They said it's impossible to make the ordinary person understand. Let's not try to make the ordinary person understand. Let's try to make each other understand. So the learned, the learned, I'm talking about the top scholars in religion, they were satisfied to just try to make themselves halfway understand the terminology of religion, or in religion. But now we live in a day where I give the terminology and any ordinary person can understand. And those on top admit the man is speaking the plain truth. And they listen too. And they say, we want this too. We need this too. So if that's not, did, did it ever happen before? No, indeed. That is the history. It never happened before. So this is the, this is the, this is the fulfillment of the prophecy that says that Jesus shall return. Not Jesus the person, Jesus the Christ. Christ is a title. Christ is a title name for a particular movement. The movement of human mind. The individual mind has been moving to try to understand this world. The reality of this world trying to understand the belief or the concept of God. His mind has been moving to do that. Prophets have come to advance that movement. And everyone that moved, he was the, op the prophet was the doer, and he was the object that received the action of that prophet. Right? Didn't Christ say, I am the object? The prophets are the action. He said, I didn't come to change the law. I come to fulfill. And he, and he refused to say he was a prophet. Why? Because though he was a prophet, but not a prophet in that sense. He was a prophet whose role was uh, to receive prophecy and guidance from prophets and respond to it and come into that form that that divine 
word or message was intended to bring about. So he said, I am the way. I am the light. I am the truth. Isn't that what the Bible says of Jesus? What does he mean? That God? No, not God. The prophet? No, not the prophet. But I am the thing that the prophet is trying to produce. That God raised prophets to produce. I am that. You are trying to follow it. I am that. You see? Okay, hold up. Now, Prophet Muhammad is the last universal prophet. So we see all the prophets in here. He was trying to, to, and he did do it. God made him and he did do it. He, was, he had to do it. He was trying to complete. He was trying to complete and did complete the working, the action that would produce the object. You understand? And he completed the work, the Quran, was the com is the completed message. He completed the action, the work that will bring to completion the man, the individual that God is acting on with the hands of his prophets. You understand? So when the last prophet comes, he finished the work on the object. When the work is finished, we ought to see the object finished. The object is Christ. Now, let me, let me go again. I want this to be thoroughly clear. Let me repeat it. Prophets have been coming to complete an object. Complete the forming of an object. Those prophets themselves had to be complete for that time in order to complete the forming of that object. Follow me now. If Jesus in his day wasn't complete enough as a prophet, because he was both prophet and Christ. Study the whole of Quran in the Bible. Both prophet and Christ at the same time. If he wasn't uh, powerful enough or complete enough as the object, then he wouldn't have been able to do the job on the object as a prophet. As a prophet, he was doing the job on the object. But he himself was the object that had been completed for that period of time that was before him by the works of prophets that went before him. So he said, I fulfill, not only fulfill, I complete what went before me. If you want to see the completion of what went before me, look at me. You will see from Adam, you will see from Adam to the last prophet in me. That's what Jesus was saying. Fulfill the law. But at the same time, he was a prophet predicting into the future. Is that right? Shining light into the future and telling us that this ain't all of it. Something more has to come. When Prophet Muhammad came, he preached as a prophet, a last prophet, and he was working on the object. The object is man, human being, not you as a male sex creature, you as a person, as a human creature. His work was to complete that, and he was working on it, and he had the tools for the completion of the job, so he completed it. But now after the action has been done, in time, we're going to see the object. So since he was the actor on the object, the object had to come later. You see? All right. That's not saying that he himself as object, because the prophet is a person too. He ain't an angel. He's not a spook. So as object, he was complete too. But he couldn't, he couldn't say it. He couldn't tell you. He couldn't preach it. Why he couldn't preach it? Because the mind of the individual wasn't yet ready for it. It wasn't time. Not only the mind of the individual, but Prophet Muhammad's mind as an Arab wasn't ready for it. 
Prophet Muhammad's mind as a prophet was ready. But Prophet Muhammad's mind as an Arab was not ready. Now, I know I'll shake some minds by saying these things. Let me explain. If his mind as an Arab was ready, God would have given it to his people at that time. But God doesn't just pick men for the time. God picked men for the future. And a prophet is a man that's picked not only for the time, but for the future. Do you understand? All right. So Prophet Muhammad was a prophet. He was picked not only for the time, but for the future. So his mind, as an Arab mind, was a part of the society. It was just the best mind in the society, the innocent, true, upright mind of the society. And that mind received revelation. And he, as a prophet, as an individual, he had to submit and swoon and, 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 and uh, be perplexed at times because of the revelation. Many times he was worried. Does the, doesn't the whole Quran tell you that he was married? That shows you that the message was beyond his mind. His message was universal, a message for all time. He himself as a moral person, as a spiritual and moral body, was complete and fit for that message. But as a worldly man, as a man who gained, got his knowledge and his mind from society, as an Arab, no. I don't know if you'll understand me, but I'm just telling you some truth. Well, what about your mind? My mind is of a new time. My mind is, uh, is a mind that's two, almost, uh, well, 1,400 years behind that time. Over that long period of 1,400 years, God, through his natural working, has brought the mind of the world to the position where the mind is ready now to not only be doer, prophet, acting to form the object, but the mind is ready to come into the, into the form and be the object. See? So Christ, his title and his image and his nature, his role, is to be the, ob the object of God's will. The object of God's will is to establish an example. One who follow his will, obey his will. 